Welcome. Um, really, really excited uh, to be kicking off our, our second Tic Tac uh, show and tell event here. Um, as we said, we've just been waiting for other people to, to join, but we don't want to be too tardy. This is supposed to be a really quick, snappy, punchy event. Um, so let's kick off and other people can uh, continue joining uh, as and when they are able to. It's fantastic. We're actually up to nearly 90 participants already, which is amazing given we are over a year into just doing Zoom events. Um, I'm astonished no one else is bored. Uh, but yeah, welcome all. It's great to see you. Um, so I am Rebecca Rumble. I'm uh, head of research at my society, um, and we've been running Tech Tech now for nearly seven, ne nearly seven years. Um, obviously, this used to be a annual conference event with some little research events in between, but we've been online for for the last year, as has everyone else. Um, so yeah, welcome. Um, thank you, obviously, to, to all of our speakers for, for joining us and putting together some incredibly interesting uh, sessions for us. Um, and thank you all uh, for participating. It's really, as I said, it's really, really great to see so many people are still willing uh, to join a Zoom call at this point. So really, really pleased to see you all and so pleased as well that we've got such an international audience um, testament to the fact that some of the, the fantastic presentations that we've got here are so relevant um, across borders. So just a quick uh, housekeeping reminder, um, we are recording this event for those other people that aren't able to join us live. Um, it's nighttime in various corners of the world. so. Uh, I'm sure some people would like to access this uh, when they're actually awake. Um, please ask questions in the chat. It's there for interaction. Because of the nature of this event, though, we're not going to be asking speakers uh, just to answer questions live. What we're going to be doing is we will collect all of those questions and we will ask the speakers to provide a substantial answer afterwards and we will email that around to everyone so that they have access to that. It enables us to keep the kind of pace going and it means that speakers can actually put you know a little bit of thought uh, and maybe a little bit extra into their answers to you um, rather than kind of being on the back foot trying to uh, trying to be very quick about it but also trying to give you a good answer. So as I say please put all your questions in the chat. Um, we will collect them all. We will send them all out to the relevant speakers and you will get an answer very, very soon. Please tweet as well. Obviously tweeting is still a thing. Um, we're using hashtag Tic Tech. Um, details again will be posted periodically in the chat for you to see, uh, but it'd be great to know what you think. Um, and yeah, that's, um, it's up to you if you want to have your camera on or not. Um, obviously, I love to see all your faces, um, but it's very, very exhausting as well. I know having your camera on and being you know, on all the time. So if you want to turn it off, feel free to do so. Um, and we have some collaborative notes as well. Um, the, the link again will be in the chat if you would like to contribute to, to the note taking. Um, on the presentations that are going on here, please jump in there and do so. Um, so I think I was supposed to be going through these slides. Um, as I've said, Tic Tac um, is one of our flagship events. It's mostly focused around impact research. Um, and hopefully, I'm keeping my fingers crossed really tightly, uh, we will be able to meet in person again next year and have that kind of wonderful interaction and conversations uh, that we would normally have in person. Um, as I've said, I think I've been through all of those. Um, and one last thing before I pass on to our lovely speakers, um, next Wednesday, um, we are going to be launching a report about reforming freedom of information in the UK. Um, we've done a lot of work on how freedom of information operates over the last few years. Many of you will know uh, that my society run the What Do They Know and Albertelli websites, which um, assist people in making freedom of information requests. Um, and we've got some what we think are really, really exciting ideas uh, for how freedom of information can be reformed and can be better, um, especially in terms of being able to, to use it and benefiting the public in terms of holding the government to account. So please do join us for that event next week if that is of interest to you. Um, so moving swiftly on, each speaker will have 
seven minutes to make the presentation. We are going to be very brutal uh, with the cutoff. There is going to be a time effort for all of our speakers. And once their seven minutes is up, uh, we will be moving swiftly on. Um, they will be muted if they go over seven minutes, just so we can keep to time. So um, I have utter faith that all our speakers are well drilled and, and we'll be able to do that. Um, um, without further ado, um, I am going to hand over to our first speaker. It's uh, Chloe Poud um, from Civocracy. Um, Chloe, here we are, excellent. Very, very quick off the bat. Okay, so Chloe, over to you. Hi, everybody. So I'll try to be sharp for seven minutes. So my name is Chloe. I'm the founder of uh, Civocracy, a citizen engagement platform. We work with over 50 government organizations in Europe, helping them gather their community around goal projects and policies to collect their feedback and insights. Our mission is to foster inclusion, transparency, and collaboration between government and their citizens. So we all remember 13 months ago when the whole world came into lockdown. This was such a shock. And it was time also for hard questioning. I think about what this uh, crisis was pointing out on our deficiencies in our society. And of course, um, our team at Civocracy was no exception. We felt that we could play an important role to facilitate a dialogue and the emergence of idea about the changes people wanted to see in the world after COVID. Uh, the problem is like the many cities we work with were so overwhelmed with like uh, restriction and all this uh, emergency they had to face on, they couldn't tackle this momentum. So we had to find another way. We have uh, 20,000 French people subscribe on our platform on Civocracy. So we decided in a few weeks to launch a complete independent consultation asking one simple question. What do we want for the world after COVID? We called uh, this movement Construisons Demain. So let's build tomorrow together. And uh, we launched online questionnaire, open discussion webinar to collect those ideas. We partner with like sev uh, several um, organizations special, uh, specialize in the transition. After a few days rolling on this project, one of my very good friends, Marc-Antoine, who is also the CEO of a civic tech platform named Toguna, he called me saying that they were doing exactly the same thing. And actually that many several uh, initiatives similar to us was appearing everywhere in France. So the opportunity to gather those initiatives together and amplify the voice of citizens was too good to be missed. So Marc Antoine has already uh, drafted a few uh, crafted sorry a few days before a website to list those initiatives and I join him on the spot. And this is how Après Maintenant was born. The requirement for the initiative to join us was very simple and clear: provide all the inputs from the citizen in open data and open source and explain your methodology of collect and analysis. So we, we in total, we, we were 14 initiatives joining forces. We received more than 300,000 contributions and 3 million citizens took part of it. Um, it was like very different initiatives. Some were like uh, professional like us, like civic tech platform. Uh, some were like parliamentarian who launched a questionnaire and question on Facebook. Some were student and association. Some tried to, to find a, a polling. It was really diverse and amazing. The most astonishing part of this experiment was in every platform, we found the same consensus around the society people wanted to live in. So there were six, six key issues uh, that French citizens were expressing. Consideration of ecological and environmental challenge, transformation and, of consumption and product methods, changing our economic model to something more sustainable and resilient, increase effort in education system, more support in health system, and strengthening our democratic functioning. Um, because in civic tech platform, every time the reproach we have was like, you are not representative, we kind of like wanted to mirror what we found on our platform with a more scientific approach to show that actually our finding was representative of what French people want. So we partner with a, a polling institute named Opinion Way, 
And uh, we took the 20 most uh, voted uh, contribution of, on all of our platform. And we asked again through Opinion Way the same question. The results were the same, astonishing. People were ex expressing exactly the same idea of what they wanted for the world after COVID. Our movement got the attention of the, pre of the French President Macron's cabinet. And uh, he mandated after a few weeks, an official analysis of the contribution that we were able to present uh, in Paris in July, 2020. So I'm, I'm not sure it was actually taking into account for the recovery plan, but it was still a big milestone. Like he audited all the platform. We had a very interesting exchange. We were able to, to present it to several of those institutions in France. So I wanted to finish. I have two minutes left. It's perfect, like with them, uh, explaining a little bit my takeaways on this experiment. I think um, there are three key things um, I observed. First, uh, the cooperation between the 14 initiatives uh, made it disruptive, but also impactful. Huh? What we started as like complete independent and all in our corner, the fact that we joined forces made it more visible and actually finished in the end of the president. The second one is for me looking at as a common future was the number one condition for a constructive and meaningful debate. There was no moderation involved and like the consensus that emerged and like the constructive idea was really good. So I think the real question behind every consultation, whether it's a local one or a, nat a national one, should always be, what do we want as a community? What do we want in our society? The third takeaway I took uh, from last year's experiment was uh, the reality, our reality mirrored in the media and social media doesn't translate what people think and what people want. Those, those uh, platforms, and I think unfortunately, a lot of the, I'm happy to discuss this afterwards, but a lot of the media are highlighting only dissensus and conflict and the fueling outrage and confusion. But again, when you set up the condition of actually thinking of a future together, there is space for debate. There is space for constructive idea. And um, there is very few people that uh, used our work in the media or in social media to actually like amplify it. But um, yeah, I think it, it, it's a shame, but it was still like a very beautiful my, uh, milestone in my career in civic tech. 13 seconds, I'm very good. So I hope I, I have two questions afterwards. I, would, I heard we can respond by email and everything. So I hope I get some good feedback from you guys. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you so much, Chloe. That was really, really impressive. Um, not only the initiative, but the fact you managed to do it within the seven minutes in a second language as well, which is not as easy, um, I don't think. Um, also, I mean, that last point you made, I think we're all guilty sometimes of sort of disappearing into social media sometimes and forgetting that actually the world is very different um than than just you know the kind of relentless echo chamber you're often exposed to so really really important points and yes obviously everyone questions for, for chloe in the chat and we will get them over to her as soon as we have finished today um right so thank you so much chloe swiftly on um we've now got abigail selman from ideas 42 and Adrian Kins from Open Up with their presentation, Understanding the Small Hurdles that Block Community Engagement with Behavioral Design. So the floor is yours. Wonderful, thank you so much, Rebecca. Um, and thanks, we're really excited to share with you today how we use behavioral design to increase community engagement in South Africa. Uh, my name is Abdel Salman and I'm a senior associate at Ideas42. Thanks, Abigail. Hi, I'm Adrian Kearns from a civic organization, Open Up, based in South Africa. Um, next slide. Uh, here is just some background on how it all started. In South Africa, community engagement in local policymaking is crucial for effective governance. As you can see, in South Africa, 65.5% of individuals had never spoken to their local councillor. 21.5% of individuals had never attended a community meeting. Um, but would have had if they had the chance to. Um, next slide. Um, Open Up developed a digital tool for community members with information on how to engage in local policymaking. 
As open up in understanding what to do in terms of civic tech, we realized the following. Access to information alone was not sufficient to drive engagement between a municipality and its community. We needed to develop a civic tech tool that went from informing to empowering and allowing a citizen to actively engage government, in this instance, a municipality. We needed to establish a relationship and ensure buying from the local municipality. We did anticipate resistance, but we nestled the project around COVID-19, its impact and the likely need for technology to ensure public participation, given the limitations, as we all know, around social distancing. Next slide. Um, Open up is focused around user-centered development. So before we even embark on software development, we want to know some of the following things. We want to know more about the environment. We wanted to know more about the environment, about community participation in terms of the various community dynamics and test various assumptions, like why citizens were not participating and what prevented citizens from participating. We wanted to know more about the environment of the municipality and the processes and what barriers municipalities were facing. Um, Abigail will expand more on how we reach some conclusions on some of the above through the collaboration between OpenUp and Ideas42. Thanks, Adrian. So as Adrian mentioned, we worked with OpenUp to um, use our innovative behavioral design methodology to diagnose the barriers that were preventing individuals participating and design solutions to help increase participation. So the behavioral design method methodology uses insights from psychology, economics, and human-centered design um, to understand why people do what they do and then design very tailored solutions to change behavior. So through our formative work with OpenUp, we uncovered eight barriers um, to participation, and we'll just be sharing two of them with you today that we hope are relevant for your work as well. So the first behavioral barrier that may prevent individuals from participating is that community members often do not consider themselves as the type of person who formally participates. It's not part of who they are. It's not how, how they perceive themselves. It's not part of their identity. And there are many reasons for this, but one reason is that even though most South Africans speak another language at home, most of the communications from government and the formal participation channels are predominantly in English. And so what this does is it sends an implicit social signal about who should be participating. And those people who aren't English speakers at home might not feel that it's um, in, within their identity to participate. And therefore they might not form the intention to ever participate. For people that do form an intention to participate, they still might not follow through on that intention and actually participate in the long run. And one reason for this is because they face many small hassles to participation. So small hassle factors like pushing multiple buttons, navigating to many platforms, or finding the contact information or location of a public meeting can have a disproportionate effect on outcomes and really deter people from participating. I mean, I'm sure we can all think of a small thing that got in our way of doing something. So we use these insights to develop low cost light touch solutions for OpenUp's platform. First, to foster a sense of identity, we simply recommended that OpenUp create the platform in many languages. And second, we recommended removing as many hassles as possible. And in this case, we even recommended that they create a submission platform directly on the tool where individuals could contact their local officials, removing all the hassles from the communication process. The last few things I wanna to touch on are lessons that OpenUp and Adrian and his team shared with us that they took out of um, employing the behavioral design process and working with us. So firstly, we received feedback from Adrian and his team that the municipalities themselves appreciated the behaviorally designed features. Um, being able to explain the behavioral mechanisms behind their design decisions really helped open up the buy-in from the municipalities. And secondly, Adrian and his team shared with us that they appreciated that some of these behavioral design principles can be applied much more generally. So the insight to remove hassles is something that you can take to any development of any civic technology. And the Open Up team has shared with us that they are consistently now thinking about how they can make their technology as hassle-free as possible. And to wrap up, um, we wanted to share these three things we hope you'll take away from our presentation today, which is firstly, that information alone is often not sufficient for civic technology to inspire action. 
but drawing on a deep understanding of human behavior can be useful to make civic technology more impactful. And some of these principles, while they are very tailored to the context and to the insights we learned, can be applied much more widely and are also useful for building stakeholder buy-in. So thank you so much. We are in time. And I'll just lastly, um, in the last few seconds, share our contact information. So please feel free to reach out to either of us um, after this event if you have more questions or want to learn more about the barriers or how you might apply them in your context. Thank you so much, Abigail and Adrian. That was that was really fascinating. And I'm sure everyone um, on this call will have had some experience of terrible digital design um, that they've been massively frustrated with in the past. Normally, uh, the, the key perpetrators are normally governments and local authorities, I think, aren't they? So all this kind of work, all the, all the research, all the design work, all the behavioral work that, that goes into making it more seamless is so, so important. So we will be really excited um, once it's been running a while to, to look at that impact and monitoring uh, research that you do on it. Um, so yeah, please, uh, again, share, share with the network as and when that happens. But yeah, thank you very much for that. Moving swiftly on, um, we've got Luke Jordan up next uh, from Grassroots um, and MIT Gob Lab um, with the presentation, and I love the name of this presentation, Don't Build It, a practical guide for those building civic tech. <laughs> so over to you, Luke. Thanks, Rebecca. Hi, everyone. So this is, I'm going to present today a guide that we just published a week ago, um, as Rebecca said, called Don't Build It, and I'll talk about why and why actually we talk about things that you can do when building um, that represents um, the experience gained over five six years building a platform in South Africa called Grassroot. Um, so Grassroot was a platform um, that I built with a team over over five six years that reached over two and a half million users and had over 40,000 activities called through it. It was ran over USSD um, and to all community organizers over WhatsApp. Um, it was used in national presidential debates and major COVID campaigns last year, including having over 100,000 users use it in a few days. Um, and it was something that was built with our users from community organizers to uh, major national campaigns. Um, my personal background is combined policy and technology. So um, both on the code and on working with the field team uh, and on policy questions. So the guide tries to combine those. So, um, the guide's headlines very quickly are, first, um, any piece of technology that you can avoid building, you should probably not build. Um, if you have to build it, make sure that you hire a CTO, um, ship very early and mature as long as you can. And no matter what happens, draw on a crew that's built over time, build lean and fast and get close to and build with your users as soon as possible. Um, now those are all quite high level and heard often. So what the guide does is tries to go into detail on each of them um, over um, it, over its length. So the first point on why not build it. Um, the point that we make in the guide and that I learned the hard way through multiple projects that we should not have built at Grassroots um, is that technology provides no friction to what you need to build. In software, anything can be built, which means that unlike building, say, a clinic or a school where it's very difficult to do it, and if it goes wrong, you're going to have an embarrassing building in the middle of nowhere that nobody uses. With technology, um, it's easy to build it. Anybody can write some code these days, cloud platforms, etc. So you need to lean against um, uh, that tendency. And so what we recommend, and again, what we learned um, and grassroots uh, over the years, was always ask a few quick questions, which is, you know, first, are people already trying to do what the technology is supposed to help them do? Um, if they are doing it, how do, um, how uh, 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 are you sure you know why it doesn't work? Um, there's often a lot of assumptions about why it doesn't work, and we think we know why technology will help, um, but often it won't help and it won't make a difference. Um, second. Uh, if they're not trying to do it, why would technology um, make a difference to that? And why would someone who doesn't want to do something at the moment, such as participate in a, online, in a deliberation, perhaps because they don't trust the government will do anything with that deliberation, want to do it just because they have a nice and easy technology to do it. So in general, first thing is don't build it. Second thing is if you do have to build it, um, there are a few, a few tips and ideas that we've learned, um, that I've learned from the practicality of it. So first, Outsourcing, um, in terms of outsourcing to developers, 
great as a tactic for bringing on individual contributors, um, but a terrible strategy. Um, and we described in the guide why procuring whole development teams tends to end very badly. Um, secondly, adding full-time talent, um, do that cautiously um, and at cost levels where you can keep them in the team and invest in growth over time. Um, and a few others through the guide. But the one that I wanted to speak about a lot today is um, well, in the time and apologies that I'm going very quickly through the material, but the um, tech and field connections. And this is something that we hear quite often um, as an injunction to sort of make sure that the technology is close to users. How to actually do that. Um, what we sketch out, what we say is an artificial way, which is you have a field team, you have a developer team, you have a daily or weekly stand up, and in that stand up, field team and developer team read bullet points at each other um, and expect each other to understand. And then every now and then go into team building and pretend to have fun. Um, and then one wonders why sort of the feedback loops aren't working. Um, an organic way to do that is to have individual level connections between field team members and developers. Um, so for example, developers go, individual developers going on field trips all the time with field team members, um, field team members bringing direct feedback. Um, developers asking field team members directly for help judging a future trade-off um, and so on. So that was something that at Grassroots we tried to do um, over time. And what it led to was that on average we were releasing new features or tweaks into the um, application and I could mention since this was running over USSD we were targeting very squarely um, people who had no smartphone or had no data um, the kind of USSD based platforms that typically are very difficult to get people to, to use and of course at the beginning we had very low user numbers or usage numbers and over time this ticked up until we were having 80 percent plus um, organic growth and it was largely through implementing these methods of having the developer team and the field team very deeply connected um, and exchanging ideas at an individual level um, rather than a collective level. Now, um, one of the things that we found absolutely necessary is having a CTO. Now, by that we mean somebody who's an engineering team, team leader more than a sort of large company CTO. Um, it's still a little bit astonishing that whereas a public health NGO that had no medical expertise or an education NGO that had no pedagogical expertise will be considered, um, uh, people would look at that strangely. At the same time, there's lots of times where we have technology or, or organizations that sort of build technology but have no technological expertise on the senior management. Um, so there needs to be a CTO um, or somebody at senior management level who um, knows and understands technology and here's a hiring some of the questions that um, could be asked of that person the guide includes um, similar hiring guides hiring questions um, and examples for junior developers ux ui and others a lot of which were used over over the years as we were hiring and building the team so that's a, a very rapid um, uh, walkthrough. Um, also in the guide, there are some examples of, of good and not so good team structures, um, hiring guides for the rest of the team, some rules of thumb on timelines and budgets, um, some guidance on technology choices, um, languages and the like, um, and of course, more reasons and rationales for not to build it. So the links on the screen um, can also contact me at any of those details and uh, hopefully it proves useful and we're very glad to hear from everybody. So that's me done. Amazing, thank you so much, Luke. And I'm sure that so many people are gonna be digging into this guys immediately. Um, there's just so much good stuff there. Um, and yeah, I look forward to going through it myself. Um, and I think that um, an awful lot of people, I know an awful lot of my colleagues will completely agree that um, there's maybe been a little bit too much in the past of people running off to build something um, and then having to backward engineer a, a reason why <laughs> almost. Um, I think, yeah, there's lots and lots of examples of that out there. Um, so great, great stuff, really useful. And hopefully um, people on this call will be able to, to use some of your advice for the future. Um, so thank you very much. Next up, we've got number four, uh, speaker number four. We're whipping through these. Well done to everyone for keeping time so far. Uh, so now we have Samantha McDonald um, of the University of California uh, with the presentation, as you can see, it takes two when citizens and Congress members deliberate online. Samantha, take it away. Great, thank you so much. Um, sorry, my own timer, just in case I can't see that one. But thank you, everybody. My name is Sam McDonald. I am a PhD candidate. Well, I just passed my dissertation on Monday, so I guess I'm almost not a candidate anymore. 
Um, I want to talk a little bit about the research that I did as part of my dissertation, testing an online deliberative session with uh, US Congress. So as a high level overview, members of Congress represent lots of people with an average being over 700,000 people. And for the past five years now, I've been studying the communication structures within Congress and trying to understand how they work. And to sum it up in a very brief note, a lot of the current communication structures really do not provide meaningful methods for dialogue and understanding for members of Congress here uh, in the federal government of the US to come and engage with their constituents in a meaningful way for constituents to also have impact. So um, I thought methods for deliberate engagement would be a great way to explore new opportunities to have this engagement, especially online. Um, so I did an experiment as part of my dissertation to do so. And essentially what I looked at was how to design a platform for deliberation between members of Congress and their, rep and their constituency that allowed the member to come in and say that they wanna talk about a topic with them and their staff supporting and having these discussions online. And I ran this experiment as an online week long asynchronous single topic forum for deliberation. That's a lot to understand. So let me break it apart a little bit. First, it was online. I worked with the company Popbox, which is a small civic tech company here in the US to run these deliberations on the online platform. And also something that could be used for longevity uh, once I graduate, that these things could still be tested and used long term by members of Congress. It was a week long to support slower moving dialogue instead of having a two hour town hall or just a unidirectional dialogue through emails or phone calls. We actually had this experiment run for a week and it was asynchronous, asynchronous in that people could log on and log off whenever they liked to have these discussions. There was no set time where they had to engage to sort of open up opportunities for people who could not come during certain times um, and also allow for that flexibility. It was a single topic and that the member of Congress specifically chose a topic. We asked them to choose a topic that would have impact on their decision making. And in this case, the member, which I keep anonymous, chose homelessness in America and that specific county to talk about those issues in which we create a single topic uh, fact sheet for everyone so they could be informed and engaged. And this was reviewed by different congressional experts and used all just government information. And lastly, it was a forum for deliberation. So taking some of the theories and these big lever, big level academic stuff of deliberate democracy, uh, we recruited a representative sample of constituents that represent the district through demographics. And we also brought in this sort of quasi anonymous stance where we knew that these people were uh, being represented by the member of Congress, but the constituents could actually use usernames to keep themselves anonymous among their peers to see if it would provoke different kinds of more open discussions online. So we recruited 300 constituents from that district using random representative sampling, half attended the forum and half were in a control group. And we had out of the 150 people, we did invite 51 people that attended in some capacity. And it was fairly represented the district of the people who actually did engage and attend. It was slightly overrepresented by males and more educated people within the district. Um, but we had some really good and uh, diversity within the group of people. For sake of time and also for the anonymity of the site, it kind of looked like this. We had a post by the member of Congress, and then there was a formatting structure that was allowed on Popbox that allowed people to comment on the post and then for the, the lawmaker to respond in their own capacity. So general findings, what did we find from this? Well, constituents really did engage substantively offering lots of different solutions for the, what they think should happen with homelessness, wanting to engage the member and asking uh, and bringing up their own personal experiences, uh, often referencing something that's called a lot in the US NIMBY or not in my backyard to talk about the tensions around homelessness in America. The members conference actually were very interesting because they reflected more of these theories called presentation of self where the member of Congress really focused on responding to constituents to show that they're qualified for their job, that they could identify with constituents and really have empathy, which is really interesting, sort of the capacity and how the member was responding to constituents. And overall, actually, some constituents were disappointed by the overall engagement of the member, asking that the member engage more, and it felt like they were kind of playing it safe, which kind of was really interesting looking at the results of what we asked people in a survey. And in a survey that we did with constituents, there wasn't uh, significant changes to people's feelings of internal, external political efficacy, essentially the way that to feel like if citizens are empowered and having engagement and impact in discussions, um, but also feelings that the, the institution is responsive to them. That being said, constituents did overall feel significantly higher impact with the members' decision making from the, uh, from the conversation compared to previous engagements that they've had with the member in the past and how they come to connect with the member. So that was really enlightening. Um, and most constituents actually really wanted forums like this. A quarter wish actually lasted longer than a week and wished that these were slower moving dialogues. 
Um, so there is some sort of appetite, at least here in the US within this particular constituency to have these longer, slower online dialogues with their representatives. We also did uh, interviews with staffers that were part of the member Congress's office after this was done. And most surprisingly to us, which I think is the whole it's take two thing here is that um, the staffers were actually the ones leading most of the conversation and that the member was not really involved in the actual engagement. This is actually really interesting from a from a standpoint of Congress, because this is an accepted norm where staffers are a huge part of the um, the whole engagement process, especially online. And it really talks to some of these dynamics that are going on of empowering staff in this part of the situation. But overall, the staffers actually found, again, that the engagement from constituents was really substantive, especially what they see on other platforms and like that. And most important to the staffers, um, was that there was opportunities for collaboration and for people who don't know understand for people who don't understand how Congress works inside each member of Congress's office they have staffers um, that focus on communication and staffers that are working on policy and actually this opportunity of asynchronicity allow them to collaborate in a way that they thought was really helpful and it's really unprecedented in some ways when you see these collaborations which in my opinion talking to these staffers may actually have more impact on the members of Congress decision making than actually going to the member themselves. Um, so it really does bring up these interesting questions, the dynamics when it comes to the value of the people behind the scenes and not just the representatives. So what does this all mean? Essentially, I believe there's a lot of potential here, still lots of testing have to, uh, that I have to do and for people to uh, test out with members and asynchronous could play an important role. Um, there are institutional barriers to exist. This was a really hard uh, project to do, lots of stuff to do. And lastly, staff are vital and kind of rethinking the role if we're looking at policymakers and thinking about the people behind the scenes as an important part of these discussions. There's a lot of work going on. The Environmental Justice Committee is working on things like this. But yeah, so that's basically it for me. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you so much, Samantha. That was a, a lot of in, a lot of information in seven minutes. Um, so yeah, great, great to great to hear that. Um, and really, I think fascinating uh, point there about staff working for, for representatives. I don't think that gets enough attention a lot of the time. People kind of see their representatives and they forget that those people do need staff around them to help them do their jobs. And it's, ha it's not being given much attention, I don't think, in terms of engagement and, and the research we're doing around that. So really, really fascinating that you've kind of highlighted that and hopefully... That will, uh, that will enable more people to kind of shine a light on that and see how we can make that better in terms of uh, participation and engagement uh, between representatives and citizens. So thank you very much. Really, really interesting. Um, we're on to speaker number five. Uh, we now have Craig Morby from FutureGov Future um, and Scott Butterfield from Blackpool Council, again, doing a, uh, doing a duo. Uh, with presentation, Leave No One Behind, Overcoming Hurdles to Online Citizen Assemblies. So take it away. Thanks uh, everyone for having us here. So I'm Scott, I'm Blackpool Council's uh, Policy and Strategy Manager, and we're going to talk about Blackpool's Climate Assembly. Um, so by way of a background, uh, councils in England are very big on climate emergencies at the moment. There's over 300 in the country. It's a kind of uh, generated from the grassroots, a kind of challenge to government policy on the agenda. In Blackpool, we want to go net zero in terms of carbon emissions by 2030. That's both the council as an organisation and the companies we control and the town as a whole. There was a real desire when we declared the emergency to put residents, businesses and young people particularly at the heart of the process. And one of the major factors that we have uh, to deal with in Blackpool is the fact that we are Britain's most deprived town. Um, my colleagues from Visit Blackpool would emphasise that we're also Britain's most popular seaside resort, but nevertheless, there is deprivation in the town. And we knew we had to go the extra mile to make sure that we had a representative process to involving communities in ways which worked for them. In terms of the format of Citizens Assembly, I'm sure you're aware, is a deliberative approach to decision making. It allows participants access to information and time and space to talk about that, consider it and come to conclusions before making recommendations. We commissioned FutureGov uh, to design and deliver our assembly and Craig will talk about a case study as a result of that. We brought 40 people in, uh, residents. We selected them through a random sample and then we made sure we oversampled in certain areas where we knew we would have issues in terms of deprived communities. 
And then we used a process called sortition to make sure that those people represented a mini version of the town of Blackpool. So representative in terms of age, sex, their home location, disabilities, and also views on climate change. We made sure that we included a question, do your views on climate change tend to differ to people nearby you? So that that way we also got the skeptics and we also got hopefully some of the more engaged uh, people on this issue. We ran sessions over four sessions of two and a half hours each, which worked very well. Uh, it was really a response to COVID that the sessions moved online, but the process of using Zoom to, to get through the sessions and to break, have breakout rooms was, was really kind of intuitive and our citizens really uh, enjoyed that, we feel. One of the main issues in that was making sure people were ready to go with the technology. Um, so we uh, made sure that we got those groups that I've already mentioned and anticipated the barriers to need. So we provided ICT equipment for those work that weren't familiar. And Craig particularly spent a lot of time and effort with people, one-to-one -one sessions on how to use the Zoom uh, call technology uh, and the tablets that we provided to certain people. We also provided webcams to, to a couple of other people who had online access. We were ready to provide internet access, but actually we seem to recruit people who already had access to the internet through some route. Um, we also had potential for paid childcare, translation and signage, sign language support, and a point of contact, which was uh, Craig to access before each of the sessions. Um, so it, all in all, we wanted to reflect on the needs of the people and deal with those appropriately. Yeah, hi everyone. My name's um, Craig from FutureGov Community Engagement and Participation Manager. So um, when Eric, a 78 year old uh, man who's living in sheltered housing, received a letter asking him if he wanted to take part in the Climate Assembly, he said yeah, because he'd heard a lot of distressing um, news on the TV, but didn't quite know what to do about it other than sorting his recycling out into the right boxes. And when he record, we received a call saying that he'd been selected, he was really happy, actually. And he said, I didn't think at my age I'd get to learn something new again, but you're never too, too old to learn. But he said um, one of the things which was concerning him was about the fact that it was on Zoom and that he wasn't um, able to use it at that point. So I rang him up along with everyone else um, in the assembly and um, just had a chat with him. We organised a one-to-one -one Zoom session and, and then I talked him through how to use and how to download Zoom, and then once he was on it, how to use the microphone and the video and the chat function, and gave him a number as well that he could give me a ring if he ever had any issues. And he said, um, when I spoke to him after the assemblies, that it must have worked because he got into every single one completely fine. And I think in the first sessions, he, he really enjoyed like the informal atmosphere when he first got on, and people were like sharing like song lyrics and stuff of. Um, of, um, of, of things which reminded him of climate change, although he said uh, Alicia Keys, this world is on fire, was a bit depressing. But, um, but then when he um, went into the presentations, they were obviously all virtual and stuff, and he found them really good and informative um, and was able to use the chat function to ask questions as well. And he said he started really looking forward to Tuesday evenings and, really, and particularly enjoyed being able to talk through what he'd heard um, with breakout groups with four other participants. And he said what, what he felt worked there was where the facilitators really got to know the people in the groups and set some good working agreements about how people would work together and um, as well as guiding principles for making decisions. Um, but Eric's group was really passionate about um, using Blackpool's natural resources to generate and buy clean energy because it's on the sea. Um, and uh, they had some really good conversations and generated solutions and captured those in, that information by using the Google Slides. And um, in the final session, we, what he liked is the fact that he was able to meet, move between different groups because we set up a World Cafe style event where they could go into different breakout rooms and he was able to have his voice heard on all of the issues. And he was really pleased that um, all of the um, things that he put forward ended up in the, in the report. But um, perhaps um, one of the best things about it was actually an unintended con consequence, which he said to me, I haven't actually been able to see my grandkids face for over a year now, but now because I can use Zoom, I'll be able to see them on that, which I thought was lovely. 
it was one of those benefits that we all kind of felt uh, was was made it all worthwhile, regardless of the deliberation, actually helping somebody in that way. Um, so we actually had 100% attendance. The 37 people who started finished. Uh, we did have actually one disruptive participant, but because we had a behind the scenes WhatsApp group, we were able to deal with that quite quickly and resolve what could have been a, an issue that took over the assembly. But we had 100% of the participants saying the technology was at least somewhat easy to use. Uh, and now as a council, we've got an evidence base, we're going to bring that together with a roadmap to net zero from the Carbon Trust, make sure that we're including people's views at every stage, and now we're moving on to identify funding for meaningful activity. The Assembly members want to keep involved in future, and so we're looking at ways of doing that too. Wonderful. Thank you so much, um, Craig and Scott, for that. Um, it's really, really lovely to hear those kind of individual user stories, because I think a lot of us, because we work slightly away from, from the actual users, we, we don't get those. Um, and, and we forget sometimes that it's so, so very impactful and so, you know, has so many other wider kind of implications and, and consequences uh, for people's lives rather than just taking part uh, mm -hmm. in, in a citizens' mm -hmm. assembly. Um, and I think, you know, it, it seems that citizens' assemblies are only going to, to kind of get more popular in terms of engaging uh, with the public and any lessons that we can learn and pass on to make sure that future ones are more effective. Um, are, are really important. So thank you, thank you very much for that. Again, um, I think there are plenty of questions uh, being thrown up in the chat, so we will send those around to you. Uh, finally, um, speaker number six, we have Mike Saunders uh, from Commonplace uh, with his presentation, as you can see here, Engaging for the Future, What Do the Public Want from Engagement and How Can Digital Deliver? Mike, you're headlining, off you go. <laughs> thank you very much, hi everybody. Um, so just as a, a bit of a context, Commonplace is a digital platform um, and we've engaged over three and a half million people in over a thousand online conversations, um, really focusing on the places that people live in, work in, play in and care about. Um, we facilitate very open, trusted conversations and through which we get high response rates. Uh, we collect lots of robust data and produce insights and reporting for our customers. And our customers are local authorities typically, um, but also planning applicants, mainly property developers. So we work across both the, the public and the private sectors. Um, we've always been fascinated about what people want from civic engagement around places um, and even more so in the last year when we've seen such a huge, in fact an order of magnitude increase in online um, engagement and lots of research showing that people feel more connected than ever to the neighbourhood. So when the government published their planning for the future white paper we took it as an opportunity to run our own research um, a representative sample of a thousand people, two focus groups, and seven years of commonplace data. And I just want to take you through some of the findings. So firstly, there's a huge appetite for long-term public involvement in planning. 76% of people thought the local, uh, local people should have a greater say in what goes on in their neighbourhoods, and 71% said that they wanted regular updates on planning issues. But despite this huge appetite, only 27% of people have ever taken part in any kind of planning engagement. And of those, twice as many have signed a, position, a petition to prevent something happening as, as have intended any kind of um, constructive engagement or meeting. So why aren't these people engaging and how can technology help? So the first big barrier we found was about lack of accessibility and awareness. Given the demand that I just talked about, um, almost half, 48% of people said they'd never even been aware of a local con uh, consultation. 70% have never participated. But if you contrast that with Commonplace, where, as I said, three and a half million people have engaged digitally, contributing over two million times and a thousand projects, and that's just Commonplace alone. So digital has a huge opportunity to open up these kind of conversations and meet this demand. The second barrier is about motivation and attitude. Um, so as I mentioned, current engagement is not only low, but it's often negatively motivated. But on Commonplace, we have not only large numbers, but we also have a very constructive set of responses. 66% of people on average are actively supportive or neutral to the plans that are being put before them. So just to give you an example of how this works, Leeds City Council use Commonplace on their transport strategy 
um, and it helped them to dial up the scale and constructiveness of their engagement. Um, they had conversations at a citywide level as well as neighbourhood based changes and it worked over more than two years and resulted in 65,000 responses. And it's enabled the council to build a deep understanding of the community need and their expectations for infrastructure investment, taking people from the very local outside their house to strategic feedback that's informed future plans in the city. And Lees was one of the councils that took advantage of a free offer that we made at the beginning of the COVID epidemic to local authorities, which has now been taken up by, I think, 65 local authorities around the, uh, around the UK. Um, the, the next barrier is about transparency. Um, and over half the people in our responses said that planning decisions were taken in secret specifically to avoid public backlash. So there's a huge trust gap there. But the trend that we see over and over again on commonplace is that digital engagements are great at delivering social proof through transparency. When people see other neighbours taking part, they're twice as likely to contribute themselves. Um, so digital engagement can harness the public's need to see this social proof, the, to, to see proof that the engagement is trusted, and this encourages lots more participation. I wanted to mention uh, Blackpool briefly, partly because uh, we work very closely with Scott, who have just heard from. Um, Blackpool Borough Council used Commonplace to run a public dialogue about Blackpool's future, and they received over three and a half thousand contributions in just under six weeks. Um, they had very, very uh, positive responses, um, and we got over two thirds of the responses via mobile. Um, which is similar across all of our projects. So mobile is an absolutely key platform for these kind of conversations. And just bringing all of that together, I wanted to talk lastly about um, Catford and Lewisham. Um, so uh, Catford is a, a town in southeast London. Um, we started a, a commonplace there about Catford Town Centre, which engaged local people in large numbers because they saw their neighbours taking part, as I've just described. The council used our dashboard to analyse the respondents by demographic, and then they used targeted social media to fill in the gaps. Um, they collected 15,000 responses online, all of which fed into and provided uh, a transparent benchmark for a subsequent master plan that they developed. And the Catford team used our tools, um, such as an ex a special tablet designed for face-to-face -face events, so they could collect not only online responses, but also collect um, responses at face-to-face uh, uh, -face, um, conversations as well. And then we conducted engagement conversations around the rest of the borough in transport, in housing, in parks and leisure, and community infrastructure. And developers are now starting to use Commonplace in Lewisham, benefiting from tapping into this active community. So we're not only doing individual projects, but we're also giving the community the opportunity to, to join up all of those conversations into something that's holistic and meaningful. Um, so now two and a half, or actually three years on Lewisham Council are using uh, Commonplace to launch their local plan, which is a very strategic uh, overview of the future of Lewisham. So our, our, our conclusions about this are that continuous long-term engagement is what people want and produces both greater volume of and more constructive engagement. Um, as I mentioned in Catford, we notify people, we join up conversations, um, we get five times more people participating if they've already participated and digital tools have the opportunity to really tap into this demand and appetite um, for local engagement and create uh, a different kind of uh, conversation, one that's constructive and one that takes people on a long-term journey. So people are more interested than ever in their communities, partly as a result of the pandemic. There's a huge appetite and there's therefore a huge opportunity for digital tools to really um, deliver the demand that we're seeing. And you can download the full report at our website if you're interested. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Mike. Really, really interesting. Um, and yeah, amen to the ongoing conversation, not just a one-off survey point. Um, yeah, the uh, the conversations around uh, local authority areas and, and how things are growing and, and being more strategic, I think is more important than ever. Um, so yeah, really interesting stuff there. Um, and again, lots of questions. We will pass them on to you. Uh, so yeah, thank you very much, Mike. Thank you very much to all of our speakers. I can't believe that's nearly uh, an hour there. Um, that's just sped by so quickly. Um, so yeah, thank you to everyone. Um, we will send uh, recordings of this with subtitles around later in the week. So if it went a little bit fast for you or if you want to revisit everything, 
um, we will be sending that round so you can do that. Um, as I said, we'll be sending answers to the questions round as well. Um, our next show and tell for Tech Tech, another session like this is on the 25th of May. So we would love to, to see you all again then, same format, um, same uh, great lineup of uh, different speakers. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much it. I'm just gonna remind you all again of that launch of our Freedom of Information Report next Wednesday, April the 28th at 4 p.m. Uh, British time. Uh, we're really excited about that. We've got some guest speakers on there as well. Um, so yeah, hopefully we will see you, see some of you there. Um, otherwise, thank you all so much for joining us. We really, we love doing these events and we're really pleased that people are still interested in joining a Zoom event. Um, again, as I said, after a year of not being able to go to a real one. Um, so brilliant, thanks very much. Um, it's we've, we've finished with two minutes to spare. Hopefully you've got time to make a cup of tea before your next call. Thanks everyone, see you next time. <laughs>